Hello, everyone. W welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. Uh, my name is Joe Saramelli. I am a psychiatrist in the department. I oversee our, our Grand Round Series. Uh, starting last September, we shifted our Grand Rounds uh, presentation to a remote uh, format, and we're aiming to have Grand Rounds presentations most weeks. Uh, we have uh, four advisory panels and uh, a trainee uh, advisor on uh, selecting individuals, inviting individuals to present in our series. I want to acknowledge the uh, funding for the series as well and make a point to invite you to, to share comments uh, on today's presentation and on every presentation using our uh, feedback format. Um, the, the survey is included in the announcements that go out each week about grand rounds. Um, For today's presentation, uh, Dr. Rebecca Hendrickson uh, is presenting. Dr. Hendrickson is an acting assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and has a primary appointment uh, at the Puget Sound VA. Uh, Dr. Hendrickson uh, had uh, completed an MD PhD program at Washington University and then psychiatry residency here at the University of Washington uh, where uh, Dr. Hendrickson uh, obtained two areas of distinction. Uh, after completing a, a fellowship in the MIREC, Dr. Hendrickson uh, took on a faculty position in August 2018. I, I want to point out one out of, uh, out of many awards that Dr. Hendrickson has, has received, uh, which is the Career Development Award uh, awarded by the VA CSR&D um, in 2018. Already, Dr. Hendrickson has uh, advised psychiatry residents uh, who are in research tracks on, and mentored uh, undergraduate researchers and uh, residents. Dr. Hendrickson uh, has several areas of expertise, including clinically uh, working in the VA PTSD outpatient clinic. And in research, uh, Dr. Hendrickson has expertise in the general area of PTSD with a focus on biologic mechanisms underlying development and maintenance of PTSD. Also, I think uh, Dr. Hendrickson has expertise in a specialized clinical trial methodology called N of one trials, which Dr. Hendrickson uses to test if biomarkers, uh, signal, bio, biomarkers of noradrenaline signaling predict treatment response uh, in individuals with PTSD. That's a, uh, one area of research. Today, uh, Dr. Hendrickson is presenting on a different area uh, related to the COVID-19 pandemic in the last year. And I'll stop for now and uh, come back later to help field questions. Please type questions into the box uh, and I'll stop sharing now. Uh, and Dr. Hendrickson. All right, good morning or afternoon now. Is the slide showing up okay? It's good. Great. So I am really appreciative um, of the opportunity to share with you today uh, the early results of our study of the impact of working during the COVID-19 pandemic on healthcare workers and first responders. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about uh, why we started this study and what it's designed to ask. Um, and then I'm going to tell you three areas of initial results. What is it that people tell us about their experiences? Um, what do we see about how these experiences are affecting healthcare workers and first responders? And then I'm gonna give you our very early results on how these effects seem to be changing over time. I wanna acknowledge off the bat that this is not actually uh, my usual area of research. I am not primarily a pandemic researcher um, and uh, I don't usually study uh, stress responses in healthcare workers. Um, my primary research question actually focuses on how is it that trauma changes the brain? In particular, I wanna understand what it is about experiencing a traumatic stressor that can lead to changes in sleep, arousal, and learning. And then how is it that our initial response, initial changes in sleep, arousal, and learning may actually be part of a positive feedback loop that uh, for some people, some of the time, um, leads to these changes becoming chronic. Um, in other words, leads to what we often think about in the context of PTSD. I'm not interested in this just from a purely academic intellectual standpoint. I want to know about this in large part because I want to understand how to interrupt this loop, how we can use either medications or potentially medications plus psychotherapy to interrupt this pattern um, so that we can prevent long-term uh, changes 
um, and improve recovery after traumatic stressors. Usually I study uh, this type of question in uh, uh, veteran populations. And my research group primarily uses an approach where we combine uh, a variety of strategies for measuring physiologic responses and uh, changes in our physiology. Um, and then ask how these changes in physiologic responses relate to changes in uh, psychiatric outcomes, both assessed via our sort of standard subjective rating scales and self-report, and also um, via some uh, more broad-based measures. I look at how these changes um, relate to each other um, by using pharmacologic interventions. Um, this also lets me ask questions about whether I can interrupt connections between changes in physiology and changes in outcome. So this would be what I would have expected a year ago to be talking about today. Um, but of course, last March, like probably most of the people uh, in this virtual room, all of a sudden my world was filled with the experiences um, of my friends and colleagues in medicine who were on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and as somebody really focused in my research life on how changes in sleep and arousal during or uh, immediately following a traumatic stressor can lead to long-term consequences, one of the things that stuck out to me listening to people's initial experiences back last March um, was statements such as, no one at work slept last night. I wake up in a panic multiple times a night and the nightmares are getting worse the longer this goes on. These kinds of statements, which I'm used to hearing primarily from veterans, uh, and especially combat veterans, were really alarming to start hearing from my friends and colleagues. Um, and although there was already, even at that point, a significant amount of published data looking at um, the rates of long-term or immediate uh, uh, psychiatric symptoms in healthcare workers, especially physicians and nurses, um, most of the data that was available and is still available doesn't address it in enough of a fine-grained way for me to ask the kinds of questions I want to know um, that might give us hints for how to interrupt these patterns. So in particular, I wanted to know more information about what about people's experiences are leading to these psychiatric symptoms. What are the impacts of these symptoms on people's work lives and professional lives? When and how do these symptoms become chronic? And given what we learned from these initial questions, um, what does this tell us about how we can prevent the worst outcomes from these kinds of experiences? Um, in order to try and get some answers to these questions, uh, we launched the ATTEND study. Now, the ATTEND study actually has two parts. The first part is a nationwide observational study where we're assessing the experiences of healthcare workers and first responders. And throughout the talk, when I talk about first responders, I'm lumping together uh, police, fire, EMS, essentially anyone who's responding to a medical emergency um, outside the physical location of our, our healthcare clinics and hospitals. Um, and we uh, assess these experiences using initially a sort of 10 to 15 minute um, online survey at baseline. We then uh, send out brief follow-up surveys every two weeks for the first three months. We have a slightly longer three-month assessment and then we check in again at uh, six months and nine months. Um, I should note that the way we are recruiting for this study is opportunistic. So it's a mix of paid advertising on social media uh, and direct outreach to professional organizations uh, such as unions. Um, so you should not, as you listen to this talk, um, think about this as representing all healthcare workers or all first responders. This is not taking everybody in a particular healthcare system and assessing their experiences. Um, this also means that uh, you're actually still recruiting. And if you, by the end of the talk, are interested in passing along information about the study to organizations you're a part of, we'll have information on how to do that at the end. Another portion of the study focuses on a small local open, uh, open label clinical trial where individuals who on their baseline assessment report high distress, particularly around sleep. Um, a subset of those individuals are offered um, participation in a trial where they receive open label prazosin for three months and then we can continue to follow symptoms via the observational portion of the study uh, up to the nine month time point. And the questions we're asking with this clinical trial portion are both around what's the impact on acute symptoms and even months after the prazosin is no longer being administered, do we have a change in the long-term rates of uh, psychiatric stress? 
for the talk today, I'm gonna to focus simply entirely on the results of the nationwide observational study, although I will circle around at the very end back to the uh, clinical trial portion. So who did we hear from? Um, the results today are gonna to talk about the first 419 participants, which are about 60-40 split between healthcare workers and first responders. Our age range extends from 19 to 72, with a mean of 40, um, so it's a pretty good spread. Um, it's skewed slightly female, 72% female. Um, and what you can see in the, the map here is I've plotted uh, every zip code where we have uh, at least one person who responded to the survey. And the darker the circle, the more people from that zip code uh, participated. So you can see there are certainly clusters to this. It's not evenly distributed. And, uh, many of those clusters are actually located in places where there have been particularly um, severe uh, waves of COVID-19. Um, that said, I uh, thought we actually ended up with a pretty broad geographic distribution of respondents. Um, and it includes a clearly a mix of uh, more urban and more rural locations. I also plotted this map um, where the color of the circle actually indicates the average intensity of exposure to COVID-19 related stressors. Um, and you can see when you look at it this way that even within a particular geographic area, different respondents may have very different degrees of exposure to these types of stressors. Now, uh, a major question when hearing something like that might be, how, how are you assessing exposure to COVID-19 related occupational stressors? Um, and this was actually something we spent a lot of time thinking about because if we wanna be able to ask questions about what about somebody's experience is leading to long-term consequences, we need to think carefully about how we assess that experience. And I was really fortunate early on in working in the study um, to um, develop a collaboration with two emergency medicine physicians uh, at Columbia University. So we started putting this together um, back in March and April um, when Dr. Chang and Dr. Sano were actually in the midst of dealing with um, working in emergency rooms in New York City during uh, the uh, COVID surge there in the spring. Um, Dr. Chang is also a uh, 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 psychology PhD, uh, who does a research program looking at the impact of occupational stressors in healthcare workers. So um, they provide invaluable uh, support in putting together a way to assess this. We used um, an approach that's modeled directly after our standard uh, rating skills. So we um, focused on asking people over the past two weeks, how often do you experience the following? Um, and we took the same benchmarks as in the PHP-9, so they'll look pretty familiar. And then we asked people a set of 13 questions. And I'm gonna tell you all of them because um, I think they're really important to the, the rest of the talk. So the first five questions were focused sort of on the volume of care people were providing during the pandemic. So we asked people how often they're caring for someone with mild symptoms related to COVID-19, how often they're caring for someone critically ill with COVID-19, how often they're working longer hours than usual in order to provide assistance or care. We ask people how often they're witnessing or responding to a death related to COVID-19 or losing a patient that they've been caring about. And you'll notice we're trying to word these in ways that uh, match the experiences of both healthcare workers in a hospital as well as first responders. Um, and we ask how often people are caring for patients who have died without family physically present to do COVID-19 precautions. And you can see I'm showing you this um, using just a uh, the set of responses provided by one of our recent participants, selected to admit at random, um, who's indicating that more than half the days they're providing uh, care to somebody with either mild or critically ill um, symptoms of COVID 19. We then asked uh, four questions um, focused on uh, more of the experience of the care provided. We asked how often people are caring for patients with known or suspected COVID 19 when they were not able to utilize appropriate PPE for the situation, how often people were feeling their care for patients with COVID-19 had been futile or unhelpful, how often people were feeling unable to provide high quality care to all patients, so we are interested in the impact on um, just the total volume of care people are providing, um, and feeling an increased risk for contracting COVID-19 with a placebo work. And you can see the participants' response that I'm showing here is experiencing these uh, nearly every day for most of them. Finally, the last questions we asked were about feeling your family was at increased risk due to your work, feeling unsupported by your workplace, maintaining a separation from a member of your household to reduce risk. And this was focused uh, particularly on folks who were maintaining prolonged separation from children um, in order to decrease risk to their family. 
And then we asked how often people were being expected to do things professionally that unnecessarily increase their risk of exposure. So all of these were designed to be scored zero to three. And before your eyes glaze over seeing a complicated table, don't panic, I'm gonna tell you exactly what to look at. Um, so in this first column, you can see the mean response for all participants for each item. And all I want you to notice here is that in general, the mean response tends to be close to sort of one to two um, with a standard deviation around one, uh, which suggests that we're actually getting um, significant responses uh, from participants to each of these questions and that we have a relatively good spread of responses. They're designed to be summed to give you a total score indicating overall exposure to COVID-19 related occupational stressors. And if you look at the bottom, you can see that in the middle column, the um, mean total score for healthcare workers, and on the right-hand side, the mean total score for first responders is actually pretty similar. So we uh, felt good that we were capturing the experiences of both healthcare workers and first responders evenly. The final thing I'll highlight on this table um, is that we asked a number of other questions about whether somebody had um, had a known or uh, likely uh, infection with COVID-19 themselves, whether a family member had had an uh, infection with COVID-19, and then whether they'd experienced the death of a family member or a close colleague from COVID-19. Um, and I was actually a little taken aback to see how frequently this um, question was positively responded to. So when we first rolled out the survey, initial responses, this was hovering around 12% um, for healthcare workers and first responders. And as time has gone on, it's um, just gone consistently upwards and it's now about 20%. All right. How did we assess psychiatric symptoms? So we have a number of measures, but the ones I'm gonna tell you about today um, are primarily our four basic tools that you'll be pretty used to. Um, so we use PCL5 to assess PTSD symptoms, PHD-9 to assess depression symptoms, GAD7 to uh, assess anxiety, and ISI to assess insomnia. Um, and if you're not used to looking at uh, ratings on these scales all day long in your clinical practice, um, what might be the easiest to look at is I've plotted the percent of uh, first responders and healthcare workers that would be considered in the clinical range on each of these scales. Um, so this means sort of passing the lowest uh, standard benchmark for suggesting um, somebody should probably receive further assessment and may benefit from considering treatment. And you can see that a substantial proportion of the respondents to the survey are in the clinical range for all four of these assessment items. Um, and just to add a little bit of extra context to this, uh, it's not a, a totally direct comparison, um, but if you, for example, look at combat veterans um, who've re returned from deployment in our, our recent um, wars, um, looking at just a random point in time, your average PCL5 score is gonna be approximately 15, um, and the rate of PTSD is gonna be about half of what you're seeing in this sample. And again, we're not, uh, assessing people at a random point in time after a trauma, um, but it gives you a sense of just how high these numbers really are. Being interested particularly in sleep, we also asked a few additional questions. Um, so anybody who reported even moderate uh, or severe sleep problems um, in any area of sleep, uh, we asked uh, about using uh, substances or medications to help with sleep. So there's about three quarters of respondents who met that bar. Out of those 100, uh, 300 people, 190 reported they were using something for sleep, 29% um, reported using prescription medications, 10% of those were benzos, 85% reported using something over the counter, such as melatonin or Tylenol PM. And then there was also an option if you wanted to, to write in uh, specifically what you were using that we hadn't captured. Um, and I was surprised just how many people um, wrote in alcohol, um, and then also a significant number of forms of cannabis. All right, so this is a lot of, uh, of symptom burden, um, and it was alarming to me to see. It wasn't clear, just looking at this, however, how much of this is related to COVID-19. Um, how much is it that we're recruiting a sample that has high rates of psychiatric symptoms in general, um, either because uh, we're recruiting people who work in healthcare and first responders um, who may have a high burden of trauma generally, um, or is there something about our recruitment methods that were particularly enriched for people with high levels of stress? So we wanted to know, are these symptoms actually related to exposure to COVID-19 related stressors? So first analysis we did was to say, okay, if we just take the total PTSD symptom score and the total on that COVID-19 occupational stressor exposure index that we walked through, are they related? Um, and the answer was very clear. Yes, they're strongly related. So I'm just 
giving you a Pearson's correlation coefficient. Um, and you can see looking at the actual points that if anything, this is probably a little bit of an underestimate that by the time you get to the higher end of the exposure range, um, you're probably even underestimating this effect. You can do the same analysis looking at depression symptoms, insomnia symptoms, and anxiety symptoms. And for all four of these, there's a strong positive correlation. PCL seems to be perhaps the tightest correlation, but all of them are, are highly related. We also wanted to know about the impact of this degree of distress on people's functioning. And we uh, looked at this in three different areas. So we first asked two questions about professional retention. We didn't find any great, really brief measures of this that captured what we wanted to know. So we just asked two questions. First, we asked how likely do you think it is that you will still be working in your current field in five to 10 years? Um, and you can see that for both first responders and healthcare workers, um, there's a good third of the respondents who say they are only a little likely or not at all likely to, to continue in their current field. We also asked, have your experiences, or how have your experiences providing care during the COVID-19 pandemic affected your interest, willingness, or ability to continue working in your current field? Um, and you can see that it's nearly half of the respondents in healthcare um, or first responder fields who are saying that the experiences working during the pandemic have somewhat or significantly decreased um, their likelihood of staying in their field. We also wanted to know about the impact on occupational functioning. And so for this, we just sort of listed the last two items from one of the NIH promise measures of social roles, which were the two that were focused on work. So we asked how often people have trouble completing all of their usual work tasks. And you can see that 9% uh, of first responders and 20% of healthcare workers responded either usually or always to this question. We also uh, asked how often people have trouble completing all the work that's really important to them. And you can see even a slightly higher percentage of uh, respondents just uh, applied usually or always. Finally, I, I really wanted to know the impact of this on suicide uh, or self-harm. Um, if you did not have uh, any in-depth assessment of this, uh, it's challenging to do that in a purely observational study where you don't have any ongoing um, connection with individuals. So the only information I have here is the item nine of the THC9. Um, but when I actually looked at this data, I uh, was surprised and alarmed. So if you just look at the percentage of respondents who give a non-zero response um, to this question about how often in the last two weeks they've had thoughts that they'd be better off dead or hurting themselves, you're at nearly one in five of first responders giving a positive response and 12% of healthcare workers. Um, as a reminder, if you look at the population of the whole, you would expect more like a three to 4% positive response to this. Um, so these are really high numbers. Again, it's important after are these actually related to working during the COVID pandemic. So using the same approach, uh, I, this is switching to um, using experiments because even more of a stretch to imagine using continuous measures, but we can look at the relationship between people's estimate of likelihood of losing the field and their exposure index. And it's not the same magnitude of relationship as we saw for mental health symptoms, but we still have a clearly significantly positive response. The same is true for people's reports of trouble completing work tasks um, and of thoughts of suicide or self-harm. Now, when I presented you this type of analysis for the mental health symptoms, I did not break it up by first responders versus healthcare workers, um, primarily because the results were pretty consistent across both groups. In this case, they vary a little bit. So if you break up likelihood of losing field, um, you can see that this uh, result is driven entirely by healthcare workers. There's no relationship at all um, visible in the first responders. Trouble completing work tasks is apparent from both groups. Um, thoughts of suicide or self-harm, in this case, while there's a trend perhaps in the healthcare workers, the effect is really driven overwhelmingly by the first responders group, who also just had higher rates of uh, non-zero response. So frankly, although we had started this study in order to look at uh, psychiatric distress in healthcare workers and first responders during the pandemic, so obviously we'd expected there to be some relationship, um, that data, when we finally looked at it, was a lot worse than I'd expected. There was higher levels of distress than I expected, and they were more strongly related to COVID-19 related care than I'd expected as well. So I really wanted to know what about these experiences are actually driving these symptoms. And when we created the measure, I actually had a lot of notions already about how I would probably group these symptoms in order to look at um, how they're impacting um, people's outcomes. 
But before just dumping the clustering by hands, it seemed appropriate to do a standard factor analysis where we just take only the data from the um, uh, exposure index and we say numerically, how do these uh, uh, different clustering cluster together? And we came up with how they're distributed amongst three factors. To my surprise, they actually clustered in a really intuitively um, sensible way. So factor one, um, but it's predominant weight on the, the five items that ask essentially about the volume of care provided. So they ask, um, it puts its weight on how much exposure people have to dust and COVID-19, dust in isolation, caring for those who are critically ill or have mild symptoms, and those who are working longer hours. So uh, going forward, I'm going to refer to this as the volume factor. The second factor groups together um, people feeling unable to provide quality care for all of their patients, being asked to take unnecessary risks, feeling unsupported by their workplace, feeling the care they provided has been futile, and being asked to take care of patients without appropriate PPE. Um, and so when I read this result over the phone initially to Dr. Murray Raskin, one of the collaborators in the study, he, without a second hesitation, termed this demoralization cluster, which I thought was a, um, a very appropriate title and one I'm going to use going forward. The final factor um, focuses its weight on people's perception of their risk themselves for contracting COVID, the uh, degree to which their families at increased risk and separation from family and local mitigation risk. So um, this factor I term the risk factor. Now, one thing that can happen as I start to sort of like uh, zoom into these numbers and these abstract ways of representing this data is it can start to feel a little bit more um, removed from people's immediate experiences. Um, so just to balance that out, I want to highlight some of what people described about what these experiences meant to them. Um, so after uh, having people rate their experiences in the scale, we also asked, um, is there anything else you would like to share with us that is increasing your stress from your occupational duties? We did not require people to answer this, partly because we wanted the survey to be easily completable on a mobile phone without having to type. Um, but we did get 172 pretext responses to this question. Um, and I really appreciate the collaboration from Dr. Kate Porter, um, also a PTSD researcher in our department and space with the VA, who has done a formal analysis of these pretext responses. I'm not going to do her analysis justice, um, but I'm going to highlight some of the types of responses we got. So when people talk about longer hours or feeling unable to provide quality care for all of their patients, the words they're using to describe things are things like that they're experiencing severe understaffing. Uh, they talk about being forced to perform all duties. Um, for example, nurses performing nursing, dietary, housekeeping, chaplain, and social worker duties, uh, in part because a lot of staff has been furloughed or is out. Um, people describe overwhelming numbers of patients being seen in their cars, parking lots, tents. The person wrote uh, that they were particularly stressed by knowing that I will miss something critical, trying to process too many patients in too short a time. What was particularly um, painful for me to read was people's descriptions of what it's like to provide care for those who are critically ill from COVID-19. A sample of what people wrote was that these are, quote, some of the saddest death stories I uh, have had to be a part of. One respondent described, quote, people begging for your help. I feel so evil and dirty having to place a BiPAP on a patient begging me not to. They don't like it and try and beg for me to let them die. I have to put patients in restraints to keep them from pulling out their tubes. They cry for me to let them go. Another respondent who um, uh, noted that they'd worked in uh, high acuity and trauma areas for nearly two decades wrote, quote, I've never felt so helpless and devastated as well as traumatized in my career. People also talk a lot about their experience of being asked to take what they felt were unnecessary risks and feeling un uh, unsupported by their workplace. People said, I'm denied PPE, even though we have it, safety be damned. Our hospital doesn't care about us, we're disposable. People spoke about having trouble bringing up safety concerns for fear of retaliation um, and even being told outright, quote, we can't quit or else risk being blacklisted from working for the major employer in the region. One thing that uh, Dr. Forster pointed out um, was that it was surprising how few people actually commented on their own personal risk of uh, developing COVID-19. And when people did talk about this risk, it was overwhelmingly in the context of how that risk impacted other people. So for example, uh, one respondent said, quote, my child had severe anxiety due to my position and frequently had nightmares and panic attacks. He had previously not had anxiety problems. Another respondent 
uh, for the, one of their major thrusters was, I don't know who will take care of my pets if I get hospitalized. Finally, there are a couple of areas that people brought up frequently that we had not had any formal way of assessing. So uh, one of these is a sense of betrayal by community. People talked about how hard it was to watch families getting together um, while we were fighting this disease and watching people die and how hard it is to be wearing heavy PPE all day at work um, and dealing with the stress and then having people in the community complain about wearing masks for brief periods of time. Also highlighted um, repeatedly were the stressors related to finances, childcare, and elder care. Um, and these came up so frequently, we've actually recently added measures to address these. All right, so now that we've uh, thought about what factors we have with people's experiences that may matter um, and, and what these factors represent, how do we look at what parts of these experiences matter for symptom development? So the way I'm going to show this data is I've used multiple linear regression model to examine the contributions of different factors to, in the first plot I'm going to show you, um, PTSD symptoms. Um, and it's important to note this is uh, a model where all of these factors are included simultaneously. Um, and the model says, what is the relative weight that I should give to each of these factors in order to best predict uh, who's going to have uh, PTSD symptoms? So, when you look at what factors contribute to PTSD, what jumps out is that, um, first of all, the risk factor is not significant. Um, uh, there is some contribution of uh, losing someone in your family or close colleague with COVID. The volume factor is a, a clear contributor, but the dominant factor is demoralization. You can do the same analysis looking at depression, anxiety, and insomnia symptoms. And I should note that even though I'm plotting these all in one figure, these are all separate models. Um, and the same pattern pretty much holds. So there are some uh, findings that make sense. So for anxiety and depression, uh, female gender seems to have an increased risk. Uh, age is a little bit protective. Um, but for all of these, the demoralization factor is particularly prominent. We can also use the same strategy to look at um, the outcomes directly. So of the factors um, and a couple of covariates, what's leading to likelihood of losing field, trouble completing work, and thoughts of suicide and self-harm. And again, although volume is part, uh, comes up as significant for thoughts of suicide and self-harm, the dominant factor from all these is the demoralization. Finally, we also use the same analysis um, to look at which of the mental health symptom clusters are most tightly associated with the outcomes we are looking at. And here you can see that for uh, likelihood of losing field and trouble completing work. It's the P uh, PTSD symptoms that are the single driving factor. Um, for thoughts of suicide and self-harm, there's a contribution of PTSD. The PHP-9 uh, shows up the most strongly. Of course, we're only assessing uh, thoughts of suicide by item nine of the PHP-9, so it doesn't really make sense to be using the PHP-9 as our uh, covariate. If you repeat the analysis, with a PHP-8, so pulling item nine out of the depression index, um, you can see that at this point, both PTSD and the depression symptoms are uh, clearly relevant to thoughts of suicide. All right, so one of the most important questions is how are these effects changing over time? Um, in particular, as people's experiences hopefully improve through these um, mental health uh, psychiatric symptoms, and uh, impact on functioning improve on their own, um, or are they sustained? So I want to emphasize that these results are the most preliminary of what I'm uh, presenting. We're still accumulating data, um, but it's such an urgent question. I wanted to show you what we're seeing so far. The first obvious question is, are PTSD symptoms even changing from time point to time point in our analysis? So just looking at the change in PCL5 total score um, from any given follow-up, uh, assessment um, compared to the baseline, you can see that yes, there's clearly a, a pretty good spread. Um, many people are getting better and many people are reporting increased symptoms. So we want to ask what about somebody's symptoms at their initial assessment suggests that they're going to have PTSD symptoms later on. Um, and the way I'm going to present this data is again, uh, the, the same uh, analysis framework um, so I'm doing a multiple linear regression. I'm giving you the, the normalized coefficients. Um, but I'm going to show you the, the covariates are going to be different. So I'm going to be telling you about 
which symptoms from the baseline assessment, and in, uh, in this case, I'm breaking up the PTSD symptoms into the four clusters, intrusive symptoms, avoidance symptoms, affective incontinence, and hyperarousal symptoms, um, and then depression and insomnia, which of these baseline assessment measures um, has what effect on um, your likelihood of having PTSD symptoms um, at a later time point, and then you're going to show the results from 16 days out. All of these also have the exposure index for the past two weeks for the um, later time point as a covariate as well. So in, in a sense, what we're trying to ask is what about your baseline presentation suggests you're going to have persistent symptoms, even accounting for later exposure. Uh, and I put this in as a separate point, so I remember to mention that I am consistent with this being more preliminary, uh, switching to plotting 80% confidence intervals rather than 95. All right, so looking at 16 days out, um, what I expected to see, uh, I mentioned that I'm particularly interested in sleep uh, and hyperarousal symptoms leading to an increased uh, chance of long-term symptoms. Um, so I was expecting insomnia um, to be a particularly prominent predictor, and it was not. Um, instead, you know, you certainly see intrusive symptoms and some of uh, clusters C uh, C and D popping up, but depression was actually far and away the largest predictor um, of symptoms two to three weeks out. Um, and it, in some ways this makes sense, right? You know, uh, part of the reorganization from DSM-4 to DSM-5 was practically including the depression symptoms in the PCL, um, uh, in the PTSD symptom categories because they're so tightly uh, connected, but this was still not what I expected to see. As you look further and further out, however, the situation changes a little bit. So we can, do the same analysis, but now trying to predict symptoms 28 days later, um, an average of 55 days later, and then um, almost three months later. And as you lengthen your time window, the results change significantly. So uh, the intrusive symptoms remain relevant pretty much throughout. Um, and the avoidance symptoms perhaps increase in their relevance. The big change, however, is that depression becomes not at all a significant predictor and the hyperarousal symptoms increase significantly. So I do want to acknowledge, as I, as I mentioned before, this is using models that are including all of these covariates at one time. So this is not saying that insomnia has no predictive power at all. It's totally unrelated to later symptoms of PTSD. And if you look at insomnia alone, just accounting for the interval exposure, yes, you absolutely have a significant relationship to later PTSD symptoms. But when you have a model where the model can choose between giving uh, the weight to um, a cluster of symptoms that's focused just on insomnia versus a cluster of symptoms that includes hyperarousal more generally, um, the statistics say it's the hyperarousal symptoms, not the insomnia symptoms that are the best predictor of symptoms. Um, there is a, a potentially, I'm trying to decide how much time I have left. I snuck in a basic science slide uh, in, in case we had time to get it. I'm going to try and include it. So one of the reasons I care a lot about this question is not just because I want to be able to predict who's going to have um, long-term symptoms, but because I want to know what to do about it. Um, and so I actually went into this uh, research project with the hope that um, if, it's, if it's something to do with sleep, or as this uh, result suggests, potentially most likely hyperarousal, during the time of the trauma that's related to the development of long-term symptoms, the next thing I'm going to want to know is, can we treat those hyperarousal symptoms during the acute period? And will that change the long-term outcome? Now you can't figure that out from just observational study, but we do have hints from other um, aspects of research that suggest this might be the case. So one of the preclinical results um, that, that really keeps me thinking about this question um, comes from work done by Dennis Rasmussen, who is, you know, what I've talked about so far is our research group. This slide is entirely Dr. Rasmussen's work that I was just very fortunate to, to work on the analysis for. Um, and to entirely oversimplify a complicated study, what this work represents is a study of rat PTSD. Um, where there was a traumatic stressor um, that was either administered with a uh, pharmacologic blockade of hyperarousal symptoms using uh, basically propranolol, um, or was administered without those medications 
So the rat was reminded of the single traumatic stressor weekly for four weeks. And then eight weeks after that, he was given uh, voluntary access to alcohol. And what the study uh, found was that in rats who they had a sham traumatic stressor and had no pharmacologic intervention, they have a rate of uh, increasing their alcohol intake during an intermittent alcohol exposure model. When they have a traumatic stressor, but without pharmacologic blockade, that rate increases somewhat. But if you block um, the noradrenergic receptors just on the day when the traumatic stressor occurred, um, the prazosin and propranolol, then even eight to 12 weeks later, you have a significant impact on alcohol um, intake. The reason I care about this result is because it leads me to the hypothesis that treating hyperarousal symptoms early may actually prevent chronic symptoms of PTSD. So that leads us to future directions. I'm first going to tell you some conclusions and then get to that part. So what do I conclude from the clinical trial or from the observational data I showed? First, I think it seems clear that working during COVID-19 affects mental health. And this is true for first responders as well as healthcare workers. So even though there's a lot of data looking at uh, psychiatric symptoms in healthcare workers um, during a pandemic, surprisingly little has focused on the experience of first responders. Um, and I think that's an oversight. Um, and it's a uh, comment that was actually noted by some of our participants. One participant wrote, it's like no one cares about EMS. We're literally on the front lines going to homes of these patients. Um, and I think one conclusion of our work is that we, we need to attend to these uh, experiences more closely. Um, the impacts are not simply psychiatric symptoms. Those are important. Uh, there also appear to be impacts on likely professional retention, occupational func functioning, and potentially suicidality. Um, to go back again to people's own words, uh, one person wrote, quote, I now hate my job. I wish I could quit. I hate, hate, hate being a nurse now. Um, I think this is uh, something we who care about the future of our field should be attending to. And finally, uh, PTSD symptoms stood out both in terms of being the most tightly related to the COVID-19 occupational stressor and also the most tightly related to most of the uh, uh, impacts on retention, function, and suicidality. It also stood out that the details of the experiences matter. So volume, demoralization, and risk were all relevant. Um, but demoralization clearly had the largest impact. And one thing that I find concerning about this uh, in the present moment is that the, the clear significance um, of demoralization ahead of risk makes me a little bit nervous about how big an effect we're actually going to have with the vaccination. So um, as much as I am overjoyed that we have an effective vaccine um, and immensely relieved, um, I think the data from this study suggests that it's not going to do the bulk of the work we need in protecting healthcare workers and first responders from the traumatic exposure uh, of working during the pandemic. And then finally, the hint from the longitudinal data suggests that PTSD-specific symptoms, intrusive in particular hyperarousal symptoms, may suggest somebody's likely to have the same effect. I also want to comment on the implications I take from this. So um, what does this mean more broadly in terms of how I'm going to think about our field and, and uh, how we approach questions in this field? And the first is I think it's wrong to ignore the emotional impact of professional trauma. Um, and I think it's wrong in three ways. So first, it's just factually incorrect. Um, it's surprisingly easy, I think, in our society and in our uh, medical field imagine that traumas we experience in a professional context are somehow protected from, um, and I think our data suggests that's not true. Um, our data also suggests that it's problematic to ignore these kinds of impacts. It's problematic both in which you're going to miss a significant driver of distress in these populations, um, and that you're going to miss a significant driver of impact on the field itself. I think that I've also taken away from this a strong signal that context matters for trauma. So this really isn't a surprise, right? If we step back and think about what we know about PTSD, um, we're all well aware that if you have the same degree of acute physical injury from an interpersonal assault versus from an accident, that something that was intentionally inflicted has a higher likelihood of resulting in PTSD symptoms. Similarly, if a child experiences abuse, um, there is a higher chance of persistent PTSD symptoms related to that abuse if one that abuse is disclosed 
um, the individual hearing that disclosure ignores, invalidates, and does not respond um, to what's been disclosed. Um, but somehow, I didn't actually expect it to be that big a factor in a professional context. I really expected that it was going to be the volume of exposure and the personal risk that would matter. Um, in some ways, however, this is good news. Um, so the demoralization factor is potentially one of the ways we can most easily affect people's experiences. And uh, we do have um, hints, even from the data we collected, that when, when the system itself uh, attends to these issues, it really improves people's experiences. For example, one participant wrote decreased stress overall um, uh, because the system is extremely supportive of everyone and is testing everyone regularly. Another individual commented that during the worst period, my duties were all high risk and were little PPE, but they were critically necessary duties. And I was clear that the system was providing us as much support as it possibly could. In fact, this person contrasted that with their later experience where PPE could have been more available, but the risk there actually felt more unnecessary. Uh, so this suggests that as long as our systems pay attention to being transparent, clearly communicating, being consistent, and addressing the needs of uh, the people making up our systems, they may be able to blunt a lot of impacts of the trauma that can't be, addressed, uh, can't be avoided. Um, and finally, uh, I do think that this data clearly supports that it, um, addressing the PTSD and especially hyperarousal symptoms early on may be one of the most important leverage points uh, for preventing long-term sequelae. Again, uh, observational study can't answer that in a causal way, um, which is why uh, I want to comment quickly on the future directions of our study. So in terms of a nationwide observational portion, I emphasized quickly, repeatedly that the, res the launching results were preliminary. Um, and one of the things we're going to be actively doing over the coming weeks and months is looking at the uh, long longer term data as it comes in. Um, we're also going to be uh, really trying to emphasize um, the small local open label clinical trial. Um, currently, this trial is restricted for participation to not only people in the Seattle area, um, but people who are veterans, uh, we have uh, applied to in, uh, expand the inclusion criteria for that, but we don't yet know if that's going to be allowed. But I really think this particular trial will give us the best data we can have about whether changing the hyperarousal symptoms during the period of acute exposure or immediately following is able to impact the longer term um, experiences and rates of psychiatric distress. All right. Um, so, if you would find it uh, interesting to learn more about the study, if you would like to share some of the um, recruitment materials with people who might be interested in participating, we have a lot of ways for you to do that. We have a study Facebook page um, that attends research study. Um, we have bit.ly links to both the survey itself and to the study Facebook page. I've been persuaded to create a, a, a new professional Twitter account um, that I'm trying to learn how to use effectively. And I would really welcome any emails um, around ideas or suggestions or thoughts people have about this. Um, before I switch to questions, I want to acknowledge just how many people have played a role, um, even in addition to the people I already highlighted during the talk. Um, Dr. Abby Schindler has been collaborating on using machine learning approaches to try and get an even finer grained understanding of what about people's experiences and early symptoms predict different aspects of their long-term course. Um, Carolyn Fort, Rasheen Slevin, and Joe Clark are the um, core staff members who have like jumped in uh, to launching the study even when it started out entirely unfunded um, in the midst of the pandemic while we were also trying to convert our primary clinical trial to virtual. Um, and there are a lot of collaborators uh, within the MIRIC and outside of it who have contributed. All right, I would love to hear any thoughts or questions people had. Thank you, Dr. Hendrickson. And please, please write questions or comments in, into the chat, and uh, I can help to go through those with Dr. Hendrickson. And as those questions come in, I, I just want to make a comment. Uh, again, thank you, thank you for presenting. Many of us spend uh, a lot of time trying to match clinical services to clinical epidemiology. And here, Dr. Hendrickson, you've you've uh, created responsive research, matching an observational study to an immediate need. And now moving on to next steps of, of testing out a trial to intervene. Uh, and on top of that, doing that as a junior faculty member, 
when common advice is to hyper focus, but being able to to adapt what you've been doing to to create something uh, scientifically sound. Really, really remarkable. Uh, one question came in uh, that I want to ask about regarding uh, given the impact of people's perceptions of their organization, what kinds of interventions at an organizational level might be helpful? Yeah, so I wish I were more of an expert in this area. Um, and I want to acknowledge that there are people who work really hard to have robust answers to this. Uh, and, and, um, and I think their <laughs> research is more important than I maybe uh, had been giving it credit for before. Um, you know, the, the things that come up in the pretext responses people gave us were a lot about whether they believed their workplaces were being transparent and open with them um, about what the resources were for PPE, um, whether their needs were being listened to and attended to. So a number of times people commented on the sense that they were asked to take unnecessary risks um, because it's what patients wanted. Um, and so if their institution was trying to, for example, stay financially afloat, um, they might be pressured to do things that didn't seem clinically appropriate and was not safe for them, but the um, workplace wanted them to do it for other reasons not related to patient care. Um, so I think communication, transparency, and a, a sort of consistent openness to information and responsiveness was what was highlighted by people's comments. One question came in. Uh, it's, it's interesting that insomnia was not predictive, uh, PTSD symptoms later. And that's the symptom that people tried to target the most, either with treatments or with alcohol or cannabis. Do you think treatment of insomnia had an effect? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so absolutely. I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, we do have, you know, I, I showed some of the data on uh, who is using something to try and address their insomnia. And we have some data on how many nights a week people are using. Um, uh, treatments for insomnia. So hopefully we'll get a little bit of observational data on any impact of taking um, medications for insomnia. But from what I presented, my best interpretation of this is that treating insomnia any old way doesn't work. Um, as much as we think sleep is sleep and any way you can get yourself to sleep is probably going to work, that's probably not it. That insomnia that results from hyperarousal is actually the core predictor. Um, and that you need to find a way to treat the hyperarousal itself, not just have some form of sleep. So well, it's a really interesting question. And, and, and what you'll address it's in the trial, it sounds like. Yeah, okay. Uh, a, a new question regarding stratifying data by different contexts. Uh, looking at geography, index of what's uh, called here's COVID friendly policies, uh, political leading of state, positive test percentage, is there a way to test if the environment of the community predicts various outcomes? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I felt bad once I, I we designed the study, you know, in April. Um, and at that point, the idea that there would be um, sort of a backlash to following basic recommendations for protection um, just wasn't as much on our radar. And so I, I regretted that we didn't have more direct assessment of people's sort of community responses. Um, that said, we absolutely have the zip code and time of each of these responses. And so we've really, um, we're really interested once we have a large enough sampling to look back and say, can we, can we look at the policies in somebody's location and the, um, the infection rates? And can we directly measure the impact of those things on people's experiences? Thank you. And uh, this is an interesting question, looking at maybe shifting uh, disorders or shifting symptoms or not, were the, uh, those who experienced depression symptoms early on, were those the same people who develop PTSD symptoms later? Yeah, that's a really good question. So one of the reasons I kept emphasizing that those results were preliminary is that I wasn't, I wasn't excluding people that we only had early time points for from the analysis when I was looking at early time points. So there are multiple ways that we could sort of have confounding with time or the population that was sampled. Um, and I'm not, I'm not able to answer that question yet, but it's something that as soon as we have more people at later time points, I really want to look at. Are there shared risks, uh, Dr. Hendrickson, that might suggest that to be likely? I, I realize this is getting outside of the data, but. Yeah, so, so certainly there's, um, I mean, uh, thanks to Deb Payson's careful uh, didactic uh, 
presentations when I was a resident, it has burned into my head. What is the single most likely uh, long-term mental health consequence of trauma? It's depression, right? So it's, it's not particularly surprising that depression and PTSD would be interrelated. Um, I'll also note that I, I didn't include it in the um, data that I showed just because I didn't want things to look too complex. We also do have a lifetime exposure questionnaire for um, previous trauma history, um, which shows that the people who are responding by and large have very high rates of previous trauma. Um, the majority have multiple previous likely criterion of traumas. Um, and when you include that in the model, it has some significance, but it's still much smaller than the COVID-19 related uh, exposure. So even in a population where we're trying to control for previous trauma exposures, um, the COVID-19 related stressors are very significant. Thank you. And another question, how might you classify lifetime trauma exposure from data collected in April compared to data collected today? What's, uh, it's a lot longer, but maybe the same stressor. How do, you, how do you, what do you do with that in your studies and what does it mean clinically? Yeah, so one of the things I also didn't include is we actually asked um, in the baseline assessment, we asked all of these exposure questions twice. We first asked straight up over the past two weeks, how often has you experienced each of these things? And then we asked, does this last two weeks represent your period of um, most intense exposure? And if not, how long ago was that period? And please re-rate all of them based on your period of most intense risk. Um, so we, we do have ways, I, I didn't want to mix together um, for these analyses, stuff that was sort of retrospectively uh, remembered uh, after a period of sometimes months versus stuff that was over exactly the last two weeks, it seems statistically problematic. Um, but I've actually run the analyses both ways using people's um, period of greatest exposure, even if it was a long time ago, as well as recent. Um, and the, the results look relatively um, similar. I think over time, we'll actually, as we get more longitudinal data, we'll be able to build more detailed time courses and see um, how um, accumulation of exposure over time changes outcomes as well. I have a, a personal follow-up question, but let me get to the next one in the, in the chat. And if there's time, I'll ask that follow-up. Uh, the, the, the rodent study that you referenced, uh, treated with propanolol and, and prezosin, would propanolol be potentially useful for the traumatized uh, individuals in the study and in the community? Yes, absolutely. So um, one thing that I uh, keep trying to figure out how to talk about more often is that in practice, we, in, in clinical practice, I use prezosin and propanolol together a lot. Um, and I think that often it has much better outcomes than prezosin alone um, or than propanolol alone. Um, a lot of times people are worried that our basic physiology classes say that we should be making people fall over if we use both. Um, in practice, that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so based on what we know from the preclinical work, it also suggests that the long-term consequences of combining them may be more beneficial than using one alone. Um, and I would love to look at that in more detail in the future. The reason we use only prazosin in this context um, is really because we're trying to be very conservative. We didn't wanna have um, a higher risk of side effects um, or even potentially immune modifying effects if we're working with healthcare workers in the middle of a, a pandemic. Um, but yes, I think the strongest effect might be from combining them together. Interesting. And a, a final question uh, before we conclude here at one o'clock. Do you have thoughts about the changing substance use, either substance use disorders or just general substance use in healthcare workers based on your findings? Yeah, so I wish we had data um, on these issues. And in fact, we've considered it and I was too afraid of running afoul of um, legal requirements to report impaired practitioners. And so I, I actually didn't include direct assessments of um, substance use. Um, but I think that everything we know about substance use and insomnia and trauma suggests that we should be concerned um, that if we don't give people a way to address hyperarousal and insomnia symptoms when they emerge, people find something. Um, and often that something is, is uh, alcohol or cannabis. Well, thank you uh, very much, Dr. Hendrickson, uh, for presenting your findings here, for talking about next steps. And thank you to our participants uh, or for, for joining us today uh, to, to learn and to, to listen to Dr. Hendrickson. And that concludes Psychiatry uh, Grand Rounds today. Thank you. Thank you so much.